welcome to another episode of Mission 150, the podcast that tells the story of Adventist mission, its past, its present, and anticipates the future. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Trim, your co-host. I am director of the General Conference Office of Archives, Statistics, and Research. And I'm Sam Nevis, the Associate Director of Communication for the General Conference. We'll be your hosts. Joining us today is Dr. Barry Oliver. Dr. Oliver is a very experienced historian and church administrator, originally from Australia, though he served as a missionary in the South Pacific. He served as secretary and president of the South Pacific Division, but for an historian like myself, he is best known as the author of a number of important studies on Adventist history, particularly Adventist organizational history in the 1901 reorganization of the church, a reorganization that took place for mission. So we'll be talking about that in a future podcast. Barry has also written extensively for the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists. Dr. Oliver, welcome to Mission 150. Thank you very much, Dr. Trim. It's good to be with you. We'll look forward to a, an exciting time together, I'm sure. Indeed. So today we're going to be talking about the first Adventist mission missionaries and early Adventist mission to Australia. Why was the decision made to go to Australia? You remember that we, we as an Adventist denomination, were getting excited about mission during the eighteen seventies and through until the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties. The decision to go to Australia really stemmed from an interaction between Stephen Haskell and a lady by the name of Hannah Moore, who I think we've talked about before on these podcasts. Hannah Moore, well, Hannah Moore went as a missionary to Africa, and there she met an Australian by the name of Alexander Dixon. Together they started to keep the Sabbath. When Dixon returned back to Australia, he apparently took his Sabbath-keeping practice with him, and he lived in a little town called Maitland in New South Wales. However, it seems that after a short time, he abandoned his Sabbath-keeping and travelled across to the United States where, by chance, he met Stephen Haskell. Haskell interacted with Dixon, and he himself became convicted that the church should start to think about Australia. At the time, Haskell was president of the California Conference. And at the session of the conference in 1884, he endeavoured to raise funds and to get an action taken to initiate a group to go as missionaries to Australia. They took an action, in fact, and then at the general conference session in 1884, a further um, action was taken and a group was put together. Stephen Haskell himself put together a group who were to be the first pioneers, as it were, of the Seventh Adventist Church in Australia. And I should have added for those watching on video that Dr. Oliver is joining us from Australia. Uh, from near Avondale University, one of the institutions that the early missionaries founded. Uh, and we're glad to, to have a, an authentic voice from down under talking about this uh, important moment in Adventist mission. Barry, who were the first pioneers and what were their respective roles? The first pioneers were a group of 11 persons. Stephen Haskell himself was the leader of the group. He travelled to Australia and stayed for only a, a relatively short time. He later returned, however, in, uh, let me just get the date here, yes, 1896. He returned to Australia at the invitation of Ellen White and stayed there for three or four years. Interestingly, he returned after the death of his first wife, Mary. And while in Australia, he married his second wife, um, Hetty. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's Hetty. right. Hetty Heard. Now, now, this is a very interesting point that not everyone will realise. Stephen Haskell, while he was in Australia this second time, actually worked very closely with Ellen White. And did you know that he actually 
proposed marriage to Ellen White because her husband James, of course, had died a number of years before, but she politely declined and instead uh, pointed him in the direction of Hetty Hurd, who had come as a Bible worker to Australia after working in Great Britain and elsewhere. So Stephen Haskell was the first one. So Barry, Ellen White actually told Ellen White actually told him who his second wife should be, if, if not her. Exactly, exactly. That is you a see, his, funny story. <laughs> <laughs> his first wife, Mary, was 21 years older than him when they married. Well, always. And uh, she was not in good health. And uh, consequently, she died a number of years uh, before him. He was only 17 at the time he married uh, uh, Mary. The second uh, group, a uh, second family that came was uh, John or Corliss and his family. Now, let me just check here. His wife was Julia and they had daughters Lulu and son Burr. John Corliss was an evangelist and he did an amazing job in getting the church uh, started off in a number of the larger cities of Australia. He remained in Australia uh let me see Be un only until 18 uh 87 then he returned again in 1893 and stayed until 1896 then there was mendel crocker israel his wife was um lizzie and he had jesse and mary as daughters he was an evangelist also and a quite able administrator, and he did a sterling job. For example, he worked as the conference president in New Zealand for a number of years. He worked closely with A.G. Daniels when he was in Australia, and he returned back to Australia in 1897. So he stayed for 12 years. Then there was a printer by the name of Henry Scott. Henry... Uh, remained in Australia for seven years. And uh, I'll refer in a little while to the journals that he published and the work that he commenced. And then there was a coal porter by the name of William uh, Arnold. He only stayed three years, but again was the forerunner of a tremendous work of literature evangelism throughout Australia and indeed the South, South Pacific. Significantly, and I, I need to mention this, Ellen White herself, as we will be aware, came to Australia seven years later in 1892 and remained here in Australia to 19, till 1900. She was a tremendous strength for the work in Australia. I, I firmly believe that the work in Australia is what it is today because of that amazing influence and perspective and wisdom of, of Ellen White in those early days. A.G. Daniels, Arthur Daniels, who of course became General Conference President in 1901, also came to Australia. First he went to New Zealand for four years and then was in Australia a little later. So some very significant committed people yeah. coming to uh, commence the work in Australia. Barry, in, in previous, um, we, we observed that when you, we would go to new missions, we would normally focus on obviously the evangelists, but also doctors, medical doctors or nurses and educators and co-porters. You've mentioned the evangelists and the co-porters. Did we have anyone from the medical uh, field uh, going around this time? And what about education? Yes, a very significant strategy in Australia and indeed in our mission work right throughout the world was the establishment of institutions. And these included publishing institutions, medical institutions and educational institutions. And Australia was no different. It was fairly soon after the arrival of the earliest pioneers that, first of all, we began to establish various health institutions. And in fact, I've, I've made a little list here of some of the earliest um, institutions of uh, health that we established. 
and it's quite a list. Now, significantly, most of them only lasted two, three years, a very short time, because during the 1890s in Australia, there was a, the economy was in a depressed state, and so it was very difficult to start new institutions. But there were health institutions, for example, in, uh, in Sydney, in Melbourne, in Perth, in Adelaide, in Newcastle, uh, the Avondale Health Retreat in the mid 1890s got started, lasted until 1935, and very significantly in 1903, the Sydney Sanitarium uh, was commenced. There had been a health home before that, but the Sydney Sanitarium still exists as the largest private hospital in New South Wales, Australia, and uh, it. Uh, it, it began in 1903 and is now known as Sydney Adventist Hospital. So health was important. Education was important. In 1892, again, just seven years after the arrival of the earliest missionaries, um, we commenced a school in St Kilda in Melbourne. And then, of course, in 1897, the big one, Avondale, what is now Avondale University, was opened as a small school, Avondale School for Christian Workers. And from there, of course, it has grown and sent uh, workers and missionaries right around the world. And then in Rarotonga, in the Cook Islands, in Tonga, in Fiji, throughout the South Pacific, schools commenced and education has been a very important strategy. Publishing, um, we started publishing six months after arriving when the first journal was published. It was called The Bible Echo and Signs of the Times. And it was published on a little press that um, uh, Henry Scott had in his bedroom. But very, very soon we purchased a building. The Echo Publishing House was established and uh, it operated for about 20 years. The Science Publishing Company in Warburton was uh, was begun in the early 1900s and it continues under the umbrella of Adventist Media to be our senior publishing house for the South Pacific Division. So some very significant things were done within 10 years. It seems incredible to me that that fledgling group of people did so much in those early years. Yeah. I really don't know how they did it. And Barry, it's striking though that they actually brought a printer with them. So they were clearly yes. planning on having a publishing ministry. They were thinking ahead that clearly a degree of thought went into who got sent on that first missionary party in 1885. Would you agree? There's no doubt about that, David. They, they certainly had a strategy in mind. There was the printer, there was the coal porter. Right. Now, by 1900, there were 45 coal porters operating in Australia which is a significant wow. number. They're all, all self-supporting. Not only did they have to have the, the commitment to go, but we had to have, have the wherewithal to, to print the literature so that they could distribute the literature. Literature was printed here already. It was being published, was being written. Uh, of course, some was being written in North America, but uh, much was also being uh, prepared and, and distributed right here. Barry, how long was the trip to Australia? Because this is not just... Today, it's a nightmare to get to Australia. It's 15 hours plus another 15 hours. It's, it's tiresome today. Um, what was it like then to have 11 people saying, we will go and, and we're going to dedicate the next few years of our lives, possibly not coming back because that was part, always part of the equation. What was that mechanics like of, of dedicating themselves to that point? Amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing, as it was for all the missionaries who, who went in those early days. Australia may have been one of the, the easier destinations, but nevertheless, it, it, was, it was considerable sacrifice. I mean, they left San Francisco, let me just get the date right here, May 10, 1885. They left on a, a steamer called, what else? Australia, <laughs> and they travelled. They travelled by uh, Hawaii and uh, American Samoa and New Zealand, and they arrived in Sydney on June six. I can remember that because that's my birthday. Uh, so May ten to June. So that's nearly a month. They were on the on the ocean. They only stayed in Sydney briefly and travelled on to Melbourne because 
they had decided beforehand, part of the strategy, that they were going to start work in Melbourne because that is where most of the literature that they had been sending beforehand, that's right, they had been, been sending literature, Science of the Times and, and other pieces of literature to various addresses in Melbourne. That's where they decided to start their work. They hired or rented a house in the suburb of Richmond. Summerlide was the name of the house and commenced work, all living in the same house for a little while, I might mention. And that would have been interesting in itself. Yes, 11 people, including four children, all at close quarters. Uh, that, that's one of the, uh, the sides of missionary work that we often forget about, of course, is just the, the personal mechanics involved. And yet uh, there's a degree of sacrifice that people are willing to make even in, in that aspect. Yeah. Yes, they they, uh, they did, um, and, and that they didn't remain there. I mean, the men in particular, um, Israel and uh, Corliss, they would go and uh, visit other cities and uh, conduct evangelistic campaigns because they were evangelists. And one of the early strategies, along with the publishing work, along with the Cole Porter work, was of course the conducting of evangelistic campaigns and. And they went first to Adelaide in South Australia. They went to Hobart in Tasmania. They went up to Sydney, then up to Rockhampton in Queensland, across to Perth. So in those very early years, they travelled extensively. And the, 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 the spouses and their children were left to fend, fend for themselves, as have been many missionaries and, and uh, other spouses over the years. Barry, were they supported by the church financially or did they have to find jobs there? Uh, no, most of those were supported somewhat and uh, not so much the coal porter, William Arnold. He was self-supporting. I do believe the others, however, had some sort of a stipend. I can guarantee you, though, it was, it was very sporadic. It didn't come along too often. But that's a big commitment for the early church, not only to send missionaries, but to send 11 people and then to have to find the ways to transmit funds across the Pacific. Um, it's a very considerable commitment for the early Seventh-day Adventist church, especially seeing it's only actually 11 years since they sent their first missionary out at all, Andrews in 1874. And just 11 years later, they're saying, we'll take on a whole new continent um, and we'll send, instead of just sending one or two individuals as we did to Europe, we'll send an entire party of 11 equipped to do everything that the early work needs. It's, you know, one has to admire, I think, the boldness, um, almost the recklessness of early church leaders who moved in faith. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I, reading so many stories. Uh, of mission around the world, the, the, the commitment, the faith, <laughs> and you're right, almost recklessness, but not really, because they had such faith, uh, was, was, was amazing. I do know that uh, when it was first being mooted that a group would be sent to Australia, um, the California Conference uh, constituency gave uh, donations. I know the General Conference gave some. There was a, a young lady, here's a story for you, a young lady by the name of Henrietta Johnson. I think she was just a teenager in California at the camp meeting. She sold her jewellery. I don't know how much she had. I don't know the amount. But she sold her jewellery and donated it to the group going to Australia. Significantly, Henrietta Johnson later married Robert Hare. Robert Hare was the first Adventist baptised in New Zealand, and uh, she came to live the rest of her life in New Zealand, having made that initial donation for the church to be taken to the South Pacific. So it was not only a commitment of the organized church, this was something that actually motivated rank and file church members back in the United States. Oh, no question about that at all. And uh, I guess we in the South Pacific owe a huge debt of gratitude for the commitment, uh, for the financial and uh, other commitment, the giving of their sons and daughters from people from uh, North America, the United States in particular, in bringing the uh, message of the gospel to, uh, to our part of the world. 
Later, Ellen White would come. You mentioned that uh, within seven years she would uh, she would arrive in Australia. And you mentioned the importance of her work in somewhat leading the church there. Was this her first uh, mission trip abroad? No, El Ellen White had been to Europe previously, and and worked there. But she came to Australia in 1892 at the request of the brethren, somewhat reluctantly, I, I think. But again, I just cannot underestimate or overestimate the importance of the presence of Ellen White in Australia. She was here when we established our first school in St Kilda, Melbourne. She was certainly here when we established what is now Avondale University and made a very significant contribution to the planning uh, of Avondale University and its establishment. She spoke in the, in the newly built chapel uh, at Avondale University before she returned to America. She had a very significant influence. She built her home, which we now know as Sunnyside, which is preserved as a wonderful memorial right here in Kurumbong. In fact, from where I'm sitting now, I can look across and just behind the trees from my home where I'm sitting is the home of uh, Ellen White, which is preserved by the South Pacific Division as a, as a, as a memorial to Ellen White. So Ellen White made a, a, a great contribution here and so many stories uh, have been written. In fact, a colleague of mine, Marion de Berg, who was the secretary in the Ellen White uh, Centre here at Avondale University for many years has written a book of stories. It's a it's a great book about her time in Australia and some of the uh, the family uh, situations and other stories while Ellen White was here in Australia. What were the Australians receptive to the message, or were they resistant of it? What was the what was it like? What what did they believe? What was the main religion? Tell me about the. The people of Australia very, at the very time. Very good question. Of course, as you can imagine, there was a mixed reception. It was fairly hard going in the early days, although there were a number who stepped out quickly. By the end of 1885, there were 45 people in the Sabbath school class, for example. That's three years. 45. That's, yeah, that, that's six one months. One so year. That's not bad. That's one year. Yeah, six the months, first, six the months, first baptism was William Wayneman. And in my hometown here of Curranbong, New South Wales, there's actually a street called Wayneman Road, named after William Wayneman, uh, who was the first convert. Um, but as they began to reach out to some of the other cities like Adelaide, there was, there was considerable resistance to, to the message. And um, things didn't go too well in some places, yet in other places went, went very well. By the year 1900, uh, there were about 2,500 Seventh-day Adventists, baptised Seventh-day Adventists in Australia, about 2,500. That compares with just over 1,000 in, the, in, the, in California conference at that time. So Australia was actually growing faster at that time than was, uh, there was California. Interesting. Barry, I'd like to just take us back now to sort of what the mechanics were to be for those early missionaries though. You mentioned that Corliss and Israel in particular, and I guess Haskell while he was there, were traveling across Australia. Of course, it takes a month by ship to get from San Francisco to Sydney, but Actually, just crossing Australia is a considerable undertaking in those days. Well, it still is, for that matter. If you were to go from, drive from Melbourne to Perth, it would take you a considerable amount of time. Back then, they're presumably going on the train, and it's, no, it's going to be no small feat to try and go out from Melbourne up even to Sydney, much less to somewhere very far north like Rockhampton or somewhere very far west like Perth. Um, you mentioned that that involves sacrifice on the part of the spouses, but it's a considerable commitment for the evangelists themselves, is it not? Yes, it, it certainly is, David. Now, I I am not sure exactly how they travelled, say, from Melbourne to Perth. I suspect they probably did it by by steamer. I know when they travelled 
from Sydney to Melbourne after arriving from San Francisco. They did so by ship. Um, there was probably a train at that time um, and there may have been a train to Adelaide. Look, I'm not sure about that. But I do know they travelled longer distances uh, by ship and so you're quite right. It was a, a real undertaking to travel and then they had to find accommodation and accommodation wasn't uh, always available. It cost money, funds they didn't have. Um, they had to uh, often uh, uh, erect a tent in the, uh, in the cities and conduct their evangelistic programs in tents because, again, halls were expensive and in some cases people resisted hiring halls to them. And so you're quite right. It, it was, uh, again, I, I, take my hat, I take my hat off to those early um, pioneers and the work that they did. But at least by reputation, Corliss was a very considerable evangelist and had a great deal of success. Um, at least the, the story, and for our, our listeners and viewers who won't know, I spent my childhood in Australia, so I have a little insight into this. The story was that Corliss was particularly responsible for building up the church in those first two or three years by his powerful evangelism. Is, is that fair enough, or does it understate the role of other people as well? No, no, absolutely. He was, he was very, very significant, particularly in Australia. Um, A.G. Daniels was very influential in New Zealand, as was um, Mendel Israel uh, a little later on. But Corliss conducted evangelistic programs, as I mentioned, in Adelaide, in, uh, um, in Tasmania. The Collins Vale Church was one of the earliest churches built in Australia. The very first church dedicated in Australia was the um, um, Fitzroy, North Fitzroy Church in Melbourne. Um, and, and these gentlemen, these, these early pioneers, had a lot to do with it. Uh, as I said earlier, Corliss came first for three years but returned for three years back in the 1890s. Barry, as they started to get a number of adherents, as they started to get people, Australians becoming Seventh-day Adventists, there was a need for spiritual nurture. Now, of course, a great institution in America and actually copied even in Europe in the early 1880s, 1880s was the camp meeting. What role did camp meetings play in Australia? Yes, that, that's a good, uh, good question, David. Th th that's another a part of the strategy, the early strategy. I guess you've got a number of prongs to the early strategy. But certainly publishing and coal porter work was, was a, incredibly important in those early days. Education became uh, very important. Um, evangelism, public evangelism, uh, running uh, tent meetings and meetings in halls was important. And I guess the other prong of the, the strategy was, was the camp meeting. Um, uh, copying, of course, the great American tradition uh, of, of the camp meeting. In Australia, the first camp meeting was held in Middle Brighton, a suburb of Melbourne. In New Zealand, the first camp meeting, a year earlier actually than the first one in Australia, was held at Napier in 1893. And so at the camp meeting, the, um, the advertising would go out in the local newspapers, the public would be invited, and the camp meeting was really conducted as, a, as an evangelistic program. People were invited from all over. It would get written up in the newspaper, and it would attract its fair share of opposition. Hmm. But it continued to be a developing strategy, and the tents were set up, the big tent was set up, and camp meeting uh, continued, I think, by the turn of the century, some... 11 major camp meetings had been conducted, but smaller camp meetings were conducted in a number of centres uh, around Australia. And even today, here we are, 2023, camp meetings are still very significant in Australia. Every conference has its camp meeting. I've just returned from the North New South Wales uh, Convention Centre, which is a large camp meeting uh, centre where every year, two or three times, depending on the nature of the camp meeting, the tents are set up, there's a permanent uh, big tent now, and um, 
Today, it would be fair to say, however, that the camp meetings are primarily a nurture strategy, whereas in those early days they were a, an evangelistic strategy. How did that work? What, what would induce Australian people to come into a camp meeting? You know, how did that work as, as an evangelistic outreach tool rather than just a nurture tool? Great question. I think they were inquisitive. <laughs> they, <laughs> they saw all these tents going up. Probably some of them thought it was the circus coming to town. I don't know. <laughs> but certainly they advertised. They did advertise. And, of course, they had a number of people that they were studying the Bible with, the interests who uh, they were invited to the camp meeting. Uh, and so the, the people came. It, it was, yeah, amazing. It's interesting. I had a colleague who was just recently speaking at the South Queensland camp meeting, and he asked me for if I could give him information. And so my department, the archives department, we did a little research and were able to discover a report in the Bible Echo and Signs of the Times, the paper you mentioned earlier, about the first camp meeting in South Queensland and how the very next year Ellen White attended. And we were even able to find a photograph. We're not sure of when exactly it was taken, but we think it was in, it was certainly within the first three years, and it appeared in that Australian church paper as well. Wow. So uh, the fact that Ellen White was attending, I guess she would have been a draw as a speaker. Oh, absolutely. She, she spoke at a number of camp meetings uh, around Australia, and uh, her stamina was incredible, of course. She was by this stage. How old would she have been by this stage? Nearly 80, wouldn't she? Close to that anyway. Uh, that's just off the top of my head. But she was speaking quite powerfully. And the camp meetings would get written up in the Bible Echo and later in the uh, Australasian Record, which commenced publication in 1898 and continues publication until this day, I might add, as the major uh, church newspaper for the South Pacific Division. But, uh, yeah, they, they, were, uh, they were well attended and she was certainly... Uh, a popular speaker. Barry, one of the, to me, fascinating things about the church in Australia is how outward looking it was. And we talked about the boldness of American church leaders, but I think we could talk about the boldness of Australian church leaders and Australian Adventists, because very quickly they start looking outside Australia before indeed they've even successfully evangelized Australia, one might say, they're looking to become missionaries themselves. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, certainly, David. That was certainly aided by the establishment of the Avondale School for Christian Workers because from the very beginning, people started to graduate and then go as missionaries, primarily to the Pacific for a start. I mean, A.H. Piper was the, the first missionary. Right. But uh, later on, Australian missionaries went to, uh, to uh, Asia, to, to India, I think, David, you yourself with your family went to India for a while. That's right. And so, yes, all over the, all over the, uh, the world, uh, Australian missionaries uh, were committed and there was a vision. There's no question that that vision was, uh, was caught and, and taught. But they particularly went to the South Pacific, I think. Now, a famous um, episode in Adventist mission history is the sending of the mission ship Pitcairn. Was the Pitcairn involved with the mission to Australia at all, or was it somewhat, somewhat separate? Tell us about the Pitcairn. Yeah, thank you, David. That, that, the term, the, 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 the name Pitcairn has a warm feel for Seventh-day Adventists based on the story of John Tay and the Pitcairn Islanders who became Seventh-day Adventists. The mission ship Pitcairn was commissioned in 1990, uh, sorry, 1890, I believe, and uh, had six missionary trips to the South Pacific, <clears throat> visiting most of the island groups of the South Pacific and having a very significant role to play in, in planting the church, in, in carrying missionaries to that, those uh, island territories. It did visit Australia, but its primary focus was on the islands of the Pacific, Tahiti, Fiji, uh, the Cook Islands, Tonga, uh, to a less extent, New Zealand. 
The first missionary trip, I believe, carried three very significant missionary families. The John Tays, who went to uh, Fiji and remained there until John's untimely death from Blackwater fever. There was the, the Gates family, and uh, Elder Gates made a, a very significant contribution to the South Pacific over many, many years. And then there were the, the Reeds. They, they were the first uh, group that travelled. But thereafter, a number of groups travelled to the Pacific on the Pitcairn. The, the boat itself, it was a twin-masted schooner. It was 104 feet or 30 metres long and cost about 47,000 uh, US dollars. And that's 1890, that's 1890 US dollars. That's right. That, what, that what was have been a today? very large yeah. investment by the church. That's a, that's, a, that's a huge sum of money. I, I can't It would be it, millions today. I it would be millions, I would say. But they had the courage to say, this is worth investing in. Well, and coming back to this idea of how mission mobilized ordinary Adventists, the Pitcairn was constructed I think, Barry, correct me if I'm wrong, largely based on offerings from individual Adventists in North America. Yes, it, it was, David. There was, uh, I, I saw a breakdown in, in my reading preparing for this meeting, and I didn't note it down. I was just looking. I just noted the total. But certainly a very large proportion of that was from donations. Um, some came from the General Conference, but not, not anything like uh, half, maybe, maybe a third or less came from the uh, from the general conference uh, but certainly a large proportion from individual donations which again as you have pointed out demonstrates the commitment of our people to mission in those early years also the the vision the the not just the immediate vision for now but the medium to long term vision of investing on an asset that will be used uh, not just next week or the week after but for missionaries uh, by missionaries for mission for a medium to long term. So there isn't, we've bypassed this immediacy and we're now investing in, in larger assets that will allow us a, a, a broader and more powerful, more impactful service. Yes, you, you, you're right. The, the mission ship pit can probably was only used by the denomination for 12 or 13 years. I think its last missionary journey was 1899. So it, it, it itself wasn't used for a long time, but it was the forerunner of ships that have been used for mission right around the world. I think of, of South America, for example, and certainly the South Pacific. In the Adventist Encyclopedia, uh, David, we've done an article by, uh, by Graham Wright, did an excellent article on mission vessels of the South Pacific. And there are literally hundreds of mission wow. vessels that have been used to travel around the islands of the South Pacific. In many cases, that's the only way to get to the islands. Not all of them have airstrips. You've got to have mission vessels. And to this day, they continue to form a very significant part of our missionary outreach. Pitcan is the first. I know that one of the vessels, one of the voyages of the Pitcan carried Dr. M uh, Merritt G. Kellogg, who had founded St. Helena Sanitarium, our first medical institution outside Battle Creek. Now he actually, you, we come back to your, your talking about the, the, several, the several pronged strategy. He's founded a sanitarium in Samoa, I believe. How has the medical work gone in the South Pacific? You've talked about Australia, but was it important in the South Pacific too? Certainly in the early days, uh, David. Uh, yes, you're right, there was Samoa. And Tonga, in particular, I think where Kellogg was uh, was significant. A German doctor by the name of Braut, B R A U C H T. I think that's how I pronounce it. Uh, was the one who was influential in in Samoa. But Kellogg himself became very important in the establishment of the Sydney Sanitarium and Hospital, now Sydney Adventist Hospital. And if you go today, there is a a museum a small museum on campus, and it's called the Kellogg Museum, named after Merritt Kellogg. So he was indeed very, very significant in the South Pacific and we should, in those early days. And we should just say, for the benefit of those who know their Adventist history, he is the older brother of the rather more infamous John Harvey Kellogg. Um, so they, they were related, they were brothers, but I think there were six or seven brothers, so there, was, there, was quite, there were quite a number of, uh, of, Kellogg's. of Kellogg's. Yeah, Barry, we've so enjoyed our time with you, we need to draw to a conclusion. 
As you look back to those first missionaries and to those early years of the church in Australia, what most strikes you? What would you like to leave our listeners and viewers with? Sacrifice. We've already alluded to that, David. The sacrifice of people, number one, in having the vision to send their sons and daughters, number two, in giving the funds that were needed because you can't do anything in this real world without funds, and number three, the commitment of the people themselves who went not really knowing where they were going or what they were doing, who were prepared to make that that sacrifice. Our church was commenced and grew on sacrifice. Oh, how we wish that that same spirit could continue this day. And and I believe it does. I believe it does. Um, And it's seen in so many perhaps different ways, but and yet the same spirit of sacrifice is in the human heart. And uh, we'll continue to carry this church, I'm sure. And we see this all over the world. Barry, thank you very much for joining us today and leading us through those first moments of this mission in Australia. Thank you for joining us on Mission 150. We hope this has been an inspiring conversation to you and that you will tell others about it. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel or this podcast, wherever it is that you are listening to this podcast. See you next week.